fun. I'm talking to Nancy Ewan about her book, Real Inequality, Hollywood Actors and Racism. So Real Inequality, when was the first, when was the first moment you realized this is a book that needs to be written? I think when I finished my dissertation, I thought, you know, all these voices of actors of color who are already excluded in Hollywood need not sit on a <laughs> mysterious virtual shelf somewhere that no one will ever read. I felt obliged and responsible and honored to, to bring those voices into a bigger public. So I knew that I wanted to write the book. I wasn't sure how I was going to approach it, and also because I ended up at a teaching institution with a very heavy teaching load, I didn't always have the time to work on it. But um, but I think that having the, the many years between uh, kind of doing the research fresh and then coming to a point where I really was able to percolate on what I've found out through field work, through interviews, through reading, through research about Hollywood as an industry uh, on a larger scale, right? Not just kind of hearing the stories, but being able to assess and think about, well, what is going on in Hollywood? Why is it such kind of institutionally discriminatory, hugely influential media, you know, a conglomerate, not just in terms of local, but global. So thinking about that and being able to come to a point where I can actually say something beyond just, you know, retelling stories, but really bringing kind of my own assessment, both in terms of kind of theorizing what the colorblind um, racism looks like in Hollywood and also uh, coming up with some real life solutions that I think typically scholars tend to shy away from. We, we kind of just report what's really bad and, and theorize how it's bad and why it's bad, but we don't necessarily provide uh, any kind of resolution. And so that was that was me going out on a limb, but also feeling like, well, if I want to reach a wider audience, which was what I came to um, after, you know, the years of in between dissertation and book, that that was what I was really motivated to do, to really write a book that that an everyday um, person off the street that I even had high schoolers actually read my book, what they can take away from this book. And, and one of them is, well, what do you do? Because it's kind of not fair to just say how terrible everything is without kind of giving giving some sort of empowerment to the reader. Yeah, well, and I definitely want to talk with you more about this idea of your audience and and what you've done, because I found one of the biggest strengths I found in reading it was the way that you kind of every every thought that I had, you seem to have anticipated in the next subsection, which I think is really interesting because oftentimes uh, theoretical arguments that are you know purely theoretical might go off onto sort of tangents. And as a reader, you might be thinking, well, what do I do with this? Or, or how do I approach the conversation in this way? And you literally have subheadings that kind of point us towards what I think your recommendations would be. So I do want to hear more about that. But first, I'm curious how you found uh, setting up the interviews and how you found people and when you approach them about this kind of topic, were, were the people you spoke to in the industry generally happy to talk about this or was this something that needed some coaxing or what? Hmm. I think overall people were very happy to talk about it, especially I think actors of color who experience it just having a sympathetic ear. I think because most of the time they have to, this is what I found in terms of actors of color who experience racism on a continuous basis, that they have to actually play down, you know, their experiences. They can't actually complain because by complaining, you are not necessarily blacklisted immediately, but uh, but you definitely are, are not invited back into, especially if, if it's in audition rooms, like casting directors kind of remember actors. And I had one actor who, who said that he had a very successful career, actor of color, had a successful career because he he never um, kind of judged the casting director for asking him to do accents. He was happy to do it. He said he was well, I don't know about happy, but he was uh, 
he was very professional. He talked about being very, taking a very professional approach so that the casting director will remember him as someone who is professional and, you know, collegial, I guess, pleasant to work with so that they would ask him back and for future auditions. Whereas I guess if you were militant or, or kind of trying to instruct casting directors or directors, they were, they were not happy about that, right? Because it's, it's much more uh, face threatening, I guess, and just thinking about, uh, the types of people you want to work with. And, and so, uh, in, in other words, playing the race card was not something that they did very often. So then for me to come along and really give them a platform to be able to, to air out the experience that they have on a continuous basis, I think was, was good for them. And so I, I definitely had, um, I, I even had actors who said that it felt like therapy. So, <laughs> so I definitely, it wasn't, it wasn't much coaxing. Uh, for me, it was, it was just a matter of finding uh, enough actors, and I think it took me a while because it, I, I used what's called a slow snowball sampling. So I would have uh, you know a few a few actors and ask them for continuous connections so that I can then find other actors. But I, I remember having um, like a hard time breaking into let's say the I think it was the African American actors, right? So I, I didn't know that many, and so to try to kind of break into a population and find enough voices to be able to participate. That took me a little while, but good thing the kind of theater, the kind of ethnic theater connections that I had um, through even my master's program, a master's uh, thesis that I, I did a, an ethnography on an Asian American, Pan Asian um, ethnic theater group, and through that I was able to get connections with the African American theater groups, and then through that I was able to then find enough actors, and and yeah, and thinking with with Latinx and. And white actors were actually quite easy to find because there are so many of them in, in <laughs> Hollywood. I used to joke like you just like you know threw a pebble like on the street, you hit an actor, a white actor. So um, so that was not an issue. But but actors of color were uh, harder to find. Uh, but not you know obviously I, I guess one could use that as a thing. Oh well, it's really hard to find actors of color. Mm-hmm. But I, it, it's just a matter of finding. Um, an in, right? Once I found an in, it was like it was it, the snowball happened pretty quickly, but uh, but it does it does take intentionality. So, mm-hmm. well, and did you did you have any experiences where you got sort of pushback about the topic from people that you were talking to, or maybe they saw it in a way that was significantly different than you began thinking about it? Well, I asked the, the questions I asked were very open ended. I actually never asked about racism unless they raised it. I asked because I really wanted to see. I wanted to kind of quote unquote prove that that actors of color did have a unique experience in terms of uh, stereotyping and exclusion, et cetera, because. It's, it's easy to kind of say that if I only interview them, but I wanted to interview white actors. So I asked the exact same questions of all the actors so that when, when things emerged that were racism or um, sexism or, you know, that that would come out just organically. And so, so I didn't ask uh, questions that were specifically kind of trying to lead anyone or even try to kind of push people into that realm. So, so because it was open-ended, people you know, just told me whatever they wanted. And so, yeah, so there were really, the, the only pushback I would get would sometimes I think actors, uh, especially actors of color who maybe their careers weren't where they had hoped they would be. And I think that some of the trauma made, made it really hard for them to maybe, maybe they were more sensitive about, about talking about certain issues. And, and so I was try I would try to, you know, kind of um, build a trust relationship in order to, to get them to feel comfortable to be able to reveal things that maybe were difficult for them to talk about. Mm-hmm. Now, in the book, you kind of go back and forth between, uh, a wi- I think of it as a wide angle lens. You know, you look at the industry and you look at the um, the numbers on a sort of general basis in Hollywood. And then you also go into more specifics about certain roles and the way that actors either appeared or their characters appeared. And I'm wondering, when you're writing and when you're thinking about this project, how do you negotiate going from a really a really distant sort of view of the industry as a whole to a particular actor or a particular scene? How do you go back and forth, or is that something you think about when you're writing this? Well, I, I like to always use concrete examples. So even when I'm talking about something wide, um, based on my own you know reflections of, of the industry, I, I like to kind of bring it to the micro because that's where people can really relate and see what I'm talking about. 
and and because Hollywood is such a kind of um, widely accessible industry, and well, it's because it's popular media, right? That everyone kind of can relate, which I think is is great, especially for um, for for college undergrads who are reading this book, where they may or may not understand racism, but they can be kind of um, drawn into the bigger theoretical and bigger kind of um, sociological concepts through uh, the, the kind of micro stories and experiences from actors that they may know or just kind of being seduced by the fact that it is, you know, actors, Hollywood actors, that, um, yeah, that the stories are kind of what, what draws people into understanding these bigger concepts that they may not have understood before or maybe not even are, are even against it, maybe ideologically, politically, right? If they're coming from um, more conservative backgrounds, that, that stories are, it's hard to deny stories. And I think that's why stories are so important. And that's why qualitative research is so important to be able to kind of nuance and be able to really flesh out concepts that are uh, perhaps abstract or even people are resistant to because it kind of goes against their personal kind of politics. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's interesting that, uh, I mean, you go over sort of the different arguments about why Hollywood wouldn't be racist or something from uh, colorblindness to lack of minority actors to all of these kinds of ideas. Is there is there one that you see as more prominent or changing maybe in the last couple of decades or do you see them all kind of floating out there? I think that Hollywood is, is a really interesting industry because it really promotes itself as a very progressive I mean, it's even very politically active, right? I think so many of them mm -hmm. had fundraisers for Obama and um, and Hillary, and so I think that it yet it's one of the most egregious, systemically sexist and racist industries. And I think what's interesting, I mean, you bring up the last few decades, the Harvey Weinstein um, scandal coming up, coming out. I mean, that has been happening for several decades, and it's not like he is an isolated person. But the fact that Hollywood is is reacting, I mean, some of there's some like accusations of kind of like hypocrisy and, you know, kind of like, oh, you know, all the people that are saying, I never knew, you know, and mm -hmm. I think that there has been, you know, some accusations of, of that. But then overall, the fact that he's been fired from the, his company, but also, um, you know, removed from the academy. And, and that there are more and more actresses coming out, actors, female actors coming out and rebuking him, but also, you know, other, another director, right, who, who is being outed. And, and just kind of this transparency that's coming out, coming from, I think, actors themselves, which is really very powerful and, and they're being very vulnerable. And, and the fact that the, I think the industry and our society as a whole is, is generally supporting this movement um, I think is is a positive change, and and as you know, also the academy has been moving towards um, diversifying its body after kind of the Oscar hashtag Oscar so white, mm -hmm. which um, which you know th th that hashtag came out from from actually someone who is not from the industry, April Rains, who you know who is a who is an attorney, and so so I think audiences also have a greater voice in pushing for. For equality and um, and and better representation, and because of social media, so I think social media is is having an impact on on how Hollywood does business because Hollywood has been kind of the whole inertia from the very beginning of the industry has been to to kind of exclude and to stereotype and to to reproduce I think the inequalities or even exaggerate the inequalities even more. Um, that exists in society, but I think that finally, I think because of social media, so even the Me Too hashtag and social media, and I think women, uh, women and female actors, and this kind of support on a large scale is happening also through social media, and and, and the media in general, and the news media. I think it's these are these are positive changes, uh, although some might say like it's been too long. You know, it's, this has been happening forever, and the fact that it's only happening now is. Um, is kind of ridiculous given, given again, that Hollywood is supposedly this very progressive industry, but this, the casting couch stuff that's coming out is, mm -hmm. it's horrifying, right? It's horrifying yeah. to, and to know that this has been happening forever. But, you know, and, and I think that what's great about, again, Hollywood as kind of a, a metaphor, or not a metaphor, a, a stand in for kind of society in general, in, in which that there are these, because Hollywood is such a kind of 
loose art world where there's very little accountability and power. The people who are powerful are extremely powerful. And so in, in any kind of industry that mimics that, I mean, this is, this is, you know, Hollywood is just a stand in for all that. So, so, you know, including politics, right? <laughs> a lot of people have been saying, you know, maybe this will have repercussions on, on our, you know, keeping our, you know, governing officials, um, mm-hmm. accountable. But, but, you know, we'll see because it's really hard to kind of overthrow power. So, but yeah. I definitely think that Hollywood is, is, is taking a good, you know, a, a good step towards that. Yeah, it, well, I mean, it is interesting to see how things are changing. And this kind of ties back to the question I asked earlier about the, you know, the specific stories versus the more general uh, narratives or ideas, the big picture things. Because, I mean, people have pointed to uh, Harvey Weinstein now and talked about specific actresses dealing with specific situations. And that's gotten a lot of attention, as it should. Um, but then there's the other option. If you're thinking about, you know, sexual inequality and, and power in Hollywood, I mean, as you mentioned in the book, uh, white men are 37% of the U.S. population, and yet it, all the of all the episodes on cable in the years that you were looking at, 69% were directed by white men, and uh, 90% of the summer movies were directed by white men. And so there is this very, uh, very clear, I guess, sort of statistical argument or big picture argument, but that doesn't seem to get as much traction as uh, explicit stories about what happened between you know, one man who was clearly taking advantage of the power he had over particular women. And I'm wondering, I guess, um, I'm sure that I'm sure you would recommend a sort of uh, uh, widespread approach without relying too heavily on one thing. But I wonder if uh, in your experience, is it the Harvey Weinstein particular stories that get more traction and help uh, uh, maybe people make people think about social injustice? Or is it the the big picture stuff like 90 percent of summer movies being directed by white men? That's a great question, because I think about that people are can get burnt out if they hear how systemic things are. But at the same time, you need to document how systemic things are so that people can can understand that it's a huge problem that needs to be addressed. But then I think the individual feels overwhelmed psychologically mm-hmm. by, well, what can I do to change the entire system when there's, you know, hundreds of thousands of people who are who are implicated in such a system. But then, but the Harvey Weinstein, I think, are, are, or the movement against him is great because then people can couple that with stats of, yeah, like you said, of, of women and, and of white men kind of dominating an industry. Um, and, and therefore, I think there have been some articles that have, been, that have done a good job about how the kind of representations of women in Hollywood, you know, the objectification and, and the kind of allowance of sexual violence that pervades so much of television and film, that that is not separate from the kind of harassment that happens in the industry, you know, on the casting couch. That that's part and parcel of the same. It's a very complex argument, um, but this is this is happening in kind of like you know Hollywood Reporter, right? So people are starting to make some of the the linkages, um, and so I think the statistics are important because um, grassroots organizations take those statistics to um, television. Um, studios and and film studios and and they can say like look we need to move the needle this way we need to change the numbers in this way right so it's 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 good because it can help uh industry the industry set targets right and and to know like and to continue to kind of review these numbers whether numbers are improving so i think uh on the institutional level numbers are really important because i think i think gina davis in the interview was saying when she first started her institute that she would say like oh you know it seems like things are you know women aren't being represented and people are like it was anecdotal right but then when she mm-hmm. actually did the research and revealed the numbers people were shocked by how how horrible it really was so it helps people to see the extent to which the inequality is but then the stories i think are, are important because then people i think it, it draws the emotional part of of humans right to kind of want to have empathy and want to see want to see justice done because then it's not just kind of abstract numbers, but it's, uh, it's, it's actual people that like celebrities that we can relate to like, oh my gosh, you know, Gwyneth Paltrow, Angelina Jolie, right? And so I, 
can. And also it's easy, I think, for people to move against one man versus an entire industry. Mm -hmm. So perhaps we shouldn't take the Harvey Weinstein to be, you know, we shouldn't have kind of rose colored glasses about this because it, it is one person. And perhaps he is being kind of like a stand in for the entire industry because the, I guess the litmus test is whether this is going to change, you know, the change other, you know, not just like him or one other director, but that there will be actual systemic, like like maybe the union actually having changing its rules, right, and changing laws in order to protect women on a on an institutional on a large scale basis, where um, where women wouldn't be afraid to actually complain because that's what I mean. What I read from these stories over and over again was that women didn't want to come forward. Like people were saying, why didn't they come forward right away? And it's like, well, their careers prove it, right? The ones that came forward, their careers suffered, and the ones that remain silent until now, their careers prospered so that there would be uh, safeguards within the industry to be able to allow uh, women to be able to come forth. I mean, Title IX is supposed to protect women, right, from from not 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 having um, not having kind of employment, their employment threatened for, for whistleblowing. But I guess in Hollywood, that is just because it is, again, such a kind of loose industry that is so kind of power, power heavy that women are very much exploited because so much of the kind of negotiation is happening while literally in hotel rooms and Harvey Weinstein's cases. But, but I think it is, it is happening. Like I've had meetings with, with Hollywood folks, um, if, if I wanted like do consultations and we meet, you know, informally in coffee shops and such. It like Hollywood doesn't do business the way that, um, that I guess maybe a corporation, you know, a, a standard corporation would do in terms of offices. Like there's a, there's kind of a very loose web of, um, of, of the way that business is conducted. And I think that that casualness can lead to more and more corruption. And so, yeah, so I think that there needs to be systemic, I think, approaches to, to changing it and not just kind of, oh, the one person, let's just, let's just take care of this one person. Mm -hmm. Well, and as you mentioned in the book, right, it's a creative industry. And so there's ideas of freedom of expression and these, this kind of stuff. And so, yeah, like a corporation wouldn't be able to put out a call for a, you know, black CEO, at least six feet tall or whatever, because that would be discriminatory, right? But in Hollywood, you can get these very specific ethnic categories and, and for casting purposes, because you can simply say the story I want to tell involves uh, a Latina or it involves a white woman who's between this age and this weight and all that kind of stuff. And so I guess in your opinion, how do you measure or how do you how do you negotiate the idea of freedom of expression and not telling people what they must write about and they're not interfering, I guess, with their creative process, but also uh, encouraging, you know, this kind of uh, image of Hollywood that we have of primarily white and primarily uh, certain characteristics of, uh, of sexuality, of ethnicity and all of these things. How do you encourage that while also not impinging or impeding the, the creative rights? Yeah, well, that's the biggest kind of defense I think Hollywood has that, oh, we just write what we know, or this is, you know, this is, this is, like you said, a creative industry, and, and yet they're not acknowledging biases, and they're also not acknowledging the fact that, um, that stories that aren't centered around, like, the white male experience also do well at the box office, I think, and, you know, so the idea is that, okay, action film must be, you know, or comic book film, right? That's kind of the, the biggest kind of tentpole films that are being made right now, mm -hmm. that they have to look a certain way because that's what audiences want. So there's all sorts of ways that, that Hollywood likes to kind of institutionalize um, bias without kind of admitting to their own bias is that, oh, well, oh, that's what audiences want or that's what sells. So, so using kind of a market-driven argument or creative, you know, this is what we write, this is what we know. So this is where the statistics are, are are powerful, right? Because the statistics show that that TV shows that actually reflect the diversity of the United States do better in ratings, and yet they're still kind of hung up on this mythology of okay, it needs to be a white you know white cast because the Midwest, the middle American audience is white and conservative, but you know we don't even have that middle American audience, and you know that demographic is changing, right? And also. That people of color uh, tend to consume media at higher rates than their population percentages, and and also it's the assumption that white people don't want to see people of color, and that's not true either, right? Because there are more babies of color being born, so our white youth are also growing up amongst youth of color. So just their peers are not the same either. So audience tastes and audience demographics are changing, and yet 
they're still hung up on that. That's why, you know, the statistics are important. And, and also I think that there, another solution is that we need more, um, creative, creatives and decision makers and people behind the scenes of color, right? And, and uh, as well as people who are just more comfortable telling those stories because that really is where the future is. And it doesn't impinge, I think it's this kind of false dichotomy of creativity on one side and diversity on the other, right? Because mm-hmm. because we look at Moonlight, I thought Moonlight was one of the most creative and, and fantastic films I've seen in such a long time. And, and it's funny because there's there was this one um, video that was made about how how um, how the director was influenced by Wong Kar Wai, who's a uh, you know Hong Kong director, and these aesthetics that are coming not from kind of the, the Eurocentric or or white male centric um, aesthetic that I think people stereotypically think that that is what audiences want, but but we have these kind of global perspectives that are important and that are that are award winning, right? I mean, he made the film on such a small budget. And it's done well and really well. And I think that all these kind of, again, biases that, that continue to keep Hollywood thinking and believing in, in storylines that, and, and plots and, and casts that no longer hold water. And yet people are afraid of change because it's a risk because, you know, what's, although they're not, again, they're not thinking of the big picture because think of, if you think about an actor like Johnny Depp, right? He's, he's, he continues to make films despite having, I think, starred in a string of bombs, mm-hmm. um, yet they continue to kind of return to him because, you know, that's Johnny Depp. You know, he's a big star. He's going to he's gonna make money for us. But they, they give him so many breaks, right? Whereas if one movie with, with an actor of color fails, then it's kind of like, oh, well, you know, that's it's because it's an actor of color or, or you know, that, that, that or people of color just don't sell. So, so the kind of standards that are used to measure success versus non-success and the fact that a lot of times marketing isn't isn't being put into projects that they believe aren't going to do well, and it, it destines them to failure. So there are a lot of systemic decisions that are biased that then um, continue the system to continue on, you know, as it is the status quo. But but again, that needs to change because um, if it doesn't, you know, audiences are already starting to kind of make their voices heard. For example, Scarlett Johansson in Ghost in the Cell. There was a big controversy because she was mm-hmm. playing a Japanese character, and and uh, but of course their their rationale was that well we need an actress like Scarlett Johansson to kind of carry a film, but then the film didn't do well, and I think for the first time a studio uh, producer was willing to admit that perhaps it was because of the, the whitewashing controversy that it didn't do as well as they expected that that in fact audiences aren't okay with with white actors playing characters of color, and so audiences do um, are starting to make their voices heard, and I think that that studios are, are still slow to respond. But I think that, you know, with more directors of color, like Ava DuVernay, um, Justin Lin, you know, that there are there are people um, behind the scenes that are hopefully going to make a, a greater difference. I, I guess uh, one thing I'm curious about is when you're writing, who you envision writing for, like what, what kind of reader and what kind of change, if any, do you want to see? I'm especially curious because I know, I'm sure if you go to an academic conference uh, in most disciplines, they would all kind of agree with everything you're saying and it makes perfect sense. And if you were to go to, uh, I mean, certain sections of America, they would just dismiss it as, um, I don't know, playing the race card or, or what have you. And so I'm curious if if you try to take into consideration people who do have these biases and you write maybe for them, or if you think that maybe it will get to them, but not necessarily through your book. I'm just curious how you envision who you're reading to, or who you're writing for, sorry, and what you hope to accomplish by writing it. That's a great question because I actually am. I teach at a at a um, evangelical university where perhaps many of my colleagues would disagree with with my findings, and so my students are, you know, they they are coming from. Uh, potentially conservative backgrounds, and I think that I am always conser- um, I, I'm always mindful of audiences who are ideologically perhaps opposed, and I've and I've given talks where I've been met with resistance, and I generally kind of cater those talks about my material. I, I don't use the word racism as much, even though that's the title <laughs> of my book. I just try to kind of um, I, I that's where I really rely on the story, right? Where I say like these, this is what. People have told me they experience, and and then I back it up with the statistics because it's hard to 
hard to argue with numbers rather than kind of taking the the idea of justice for you know just kind of because not everybody thinks of justice in the same way especially if they don't believe that that inequality exists right so i think that um yeah, that I am. I, I think that I, I like to think that my book, because it is a blend of story and statistics, that it's because it's social science that it's harder to argue with data. But of course, if you are completely ideologically opposed, you can take all the stories as as just I don't know people complaining. <laughs> but I feel like that's why it's uh, when you hear this is the whole kind of Harvey Weinstein thing, right? When every woman kind of tells the same story, it's really hard to kind of. I don't know, for me, at least, if, if, if you're a person that is at all compassionate and empathetic, to, to kind of take all these stories that are repeats of the same things over and over again, like being told, you know, you need to be, you need to be more black, you need to be more Asian, like that, that I feel like is just offensive to me in general, right? And, and, and some of the more egregious, like I had one actress who, the name of her character in this blockbuster film was a racial slur, right? It was an Asian racial slur. And so for her to, you know, for, for anyone to think that that's okay, you know, they're maybe too far gone for this book, you know, but, um, but anyone who, you know, is at all thinks of themselves as not racist or at least wants to see kind of racism eliminated in society, I think hopefully can learn something from this book. I mean, I've actually had actors of color who have been in the industry who are veterans who are uh, who have experienced racism actually get stuff out of the book because i try to give historical context and also kind of um, systematically break down things that that maybe they experienced but they haven't had put a name to so i didn't have all these things in mind my, my main goal was to write a kind of generally accessible where I was just really focused on my language, where I really didn't want um, people to be turned off by academic language and jargon mm -hmm. because I, because I think that, you know, or they just tune out. Right. So one of my students who <laughs> admitted, confessed to me that even though she was a senior, she's like, I don't like reading college books and articles, <laughs> but she's like, but I really want, but I really enjoyed reading your chapter. This is before I submitted fully my manuscript. She's like, I really enjoy reading your chapter. I wanted to know what happened next. So that was that was encouraging to me, right? That the language would draw people in who are curious about the industry and maybe curious about, you know, inequality. Mm -hmm. Well, that said, you do rely on a number of scholars in here. Although, yeah, I don't think the language is uh, inaccessible by any means. What scholars or what theories have you found most helpful for thinking? Maybe not necessarily explicitly using in your work, but for thinking with. So I do have a chapter on colorblind racism, and I try to explain it as simply as possible. I mean, I mean, colorblind racism isn't. It, it's a, colorblindism is already a term that I think is thrown around in society. I don't know if it's always used correctly, mm. uh, especially since I think sometimes it's used positively. Where, uh, whereas you know, um, scholars like Omni and Why Not and Bonilla Silva, um, who Eduardo Bonilla Silva, who is the current um, president of the of the American Sociological Association, these scholars really break down racism in all its kind of nuances because I think we're in an age where it's so ironic because I think people who are practicing racism are actually sounding like they're not racist, right? They, they try to sound like, oh, well, we don't see color. We don't see race. It's the meritocracy, right? Everybody everybody has a full chance. And we just want to find like one of the agents that I, top agents in, in talent agents in Hollywood right, that I got to speak to uh, said that he that I'm not interested in diversity, I'm interested in brilliance, right? That, that it has nothing to do with a person's, you know, background, it has everything to do with their talent. And so, and that's such a convincing argument, right? That, you know, that why should we care about, isn't that racism to care about a person's skin color or to cast someone just based on that? I remember when Hamilton was under fire, you know, the musical Hamilton was under fire for casting, you know, actors of color, right? Because they were, they were accused of being racist, right? Which is just so ironic because I feel like you know, everything in Broadway has been the other way around. But um, I think that yeah, to be able to use this theory and to really apply it, people use the language of meritocracy, and I and I was able to kind of apply it to other things like what I've already mentioned in terms of market forces or you know or people's creative you know creative um, creative minds that these are actually forms of colorblind racism because. People are not acknowledging that there is bias, you know, there is already bias in, in choosing projects, what to fund and what not to fund. There's bias in what you write. If, you know, you can grow up in New York and you're not, and you're going to write an entire cast, you know, with, in New York of white women only, right? Mm -hmm. 
so there's you know there's there's bias and people people are not are not acknowledging i think it, 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 if they just acknowledge the bias that would be the first step into thinking okay well how can i maybe change this character's race or change this character's gender you know and i think that um i think colorblind racism the the, the concept and the theory of that is so helpful in kind of really identifying how Hollywood gets away with reproducing racism and sexism um, through uh, through this use of the, these use of languages that, that that make them sound like they're actually colorblind when they're not. Yeah, well, one, one thing that uh, sounds familiar uh, that I've heard is the, the idea of reverse racism, right? So I, I don't know if this is coming from a certain news station or from certain pundits or whatever, but uh, sometimes, yeah, when I'm, when I'm teaching these kinds of subjects, I'll hear things like, well, to draw attention to their race is reverse racism or to, to see if show and make make sure to to find a show that's cast specifically to be multiracial or whatever is uh reverse racism i'm curious if you have any what you found is like a best practice maybe to to talk about that and to deal with that kind of comment that's a good question <laughs> you're really you're really testing my teaching chops here. Well, i'm just yeah i'm trying to figure out how to do it so <laughs> i know i know it's so hard i think again i think that you have to go back to statistics and show that there really is inequality and that whites are actually um, beneficiaries of the race in all in, in all kind of economic in ways, right? In terms of education, in terms of jobs and, um, and income, that the idea that racism is gone and therefore it's an equal playing field, and so any kind of preferential treatment for certain groups is reverse racism. That's that's a myth, right? That racism is not gone, and that that we're not that far from Jim Crow. We're not that far from segregation. That that those that educational segregation is still alive and well. I think for me, I mean, growing up in high school, I thought, oh, you know, affirmative action. I'm not benef- I'm not benefiting from affirmative action. That seems like so racist, right? I, I thought those things. But then when I read a book on uh, this, co- it was Savage Inequalities. It's an older book now by Jonathan Cosell, and it talked about how education was funded by property taxes, right? Public education. And I came to the recognition that, wow, because anybody who, who grew up in public education can think about, okay, in my district, there are the good schools and there are the bad schools, right? But all of us are, should, should have equal access to education, right? And so the knowledge that people are actually, that rich people who, who, are, who live in richer neighborhoods get better schools than people who live in poor neighborhoods. That to me was, well, that just blew my mind because that was like, well, of course we need a affirmative action because that's not fair that, you know, that because I got to, you know, go to a better school than this person, that therefore I get to go to a better university and have better life chances. That that to me was just so clear, clear as day, right, when I read that. And and I think for undergraduates, that, that's a really good entry point, you know, if, if they feel any kind of justice that this, you know, if you're just a child, you know, born into a family that you did nothing, right, to deserve a poor school than someone who, you know, was born to a wealthy family. And then if you bring in statistics and, and data that shows that, well, and when you look along class lines that African Americans, Latinos, Native Americans, disproportionately disadvantaged and, and living in poor neighborhoods because of systemic uh, racism and you have to go through historically why, right? Like if you look at the, the you know, the GI Bill and, you know, of home ownership, that that home ownership and segregation, redlining, all that mm-hmm. stuff systematically prevented certain groups from accumulating wealth. So building of wealth and passing along wealth then allows you to buy homes in nice neighborhoods and have access to great schools, right? Yeah. So all those things and those are historical um, laws that that prevented people that had nothing to do with whether they were smart enough, good enough, or hardworking enough. So, mm-hmm. well, and that's, I, yeah. that's my very short kind of. <laughs> You know, reverse racism doesn't can't exist because it's like this. <laughs> yeah, well, and I think that's part of the issue, right? Is that it's very easy to yell out like reverse racism or something, but it's more difficult to to say, well, actually, these laws from this historical period have influenced this thing, which is happening now. And it, I mean, it gets more complicated, right? But um, I'm curious about how you see uh, class fitting in because in some cases you know, i mean people equate those you know class and and race uh, for advantages and disadvantages and then in other ways people might want to separate that and of course you talk about intersectionality uh in the book but i'm curious um 
especially because I can envision some of uh, some of the Marxist people I know thinking uh, you're talking about race and cinema, which is fine, but really the main question should be class. And I was I was wondering how you how you would respond to that kind of uh, sort of perspective. So I have a really good story about that because I, I my my initial target um, in terms of my interviews were uh, what, what people call what they call themselves like work, like uh, journeymen and what they call themselves like middle class or working actors. These, mm-hmm. those are, these are various names. So because I thought, okay, well, working actors, you know, they have to audition, so they are most uh, vulnerable to stereotyping, right? Especially actors of color. I thought so. So you know, I, I interviewed my 100 interviews were were targeting just average working class, or not working class, but working actors. They're they're usually middle class actually, because um, a lot of them are trained. Um, most of them are trained, and so working actors, average working actors. But then when I started to write a book, write the book, I wanted to also draw on interviews with celebrities. And what I noticed was that interviews with celebrities of color, so A list, B list actors, they their responses were glaringly similar to the average working actor of color. So, um, so which just showed that I think for celebrities of color that they are facing very similar um, systemic kind of exclusions and stereotyping that the average working actor of color. So there's actually the kind of differences between, there, there really isn't an elite kind of difference for, for actors of color because they are all facing such similar stereotypes and and the end for actors of color like for example when they were when the whole whitewashing thing was going on directors would say like there's no a-list asian american actor right and i thought well what happened to lucy Liu, right she was kind of a really big deal when i was uh maybe in college and stuff but she's no longer seen as an A-list actor, right? So even though to me she's still a celebrity, I think for a lot of people she's no longer kind of at that level. So it's very easy for kind of actors of color to kind of fall from. It's it's like it's like one film away from becoming kind of yeah. just your average working. I mean, she's still you know can can headline a TV show, but I haven't seen her in a film you know in a very very long time. And so so I think that race, if you just take the Hollywood example. Even even people of color at kind of the the higher levels, it's not guaranteed, right? Their jobs are not guaranteed. Their their status is not guaranteed because they are often facing the same exclusionary practices and certainly stereotypes in Hollywood as as the average working actor of color. So, hmm. yeah. Have you thought of, about where, where I guess sort of where you fall on the spectrum? On one side, I tend to see people who argue. I mean, I'm simplifying, of course, but who basically argue that if we show positive roles and we encourage um, actors of color to appear in in these positive roles, reality or or actuality or whatever you want to call it outside of Hollywood, so in the actual economic sphere, political sphere and such, that these things will become better because of what people are seeing on TV. And then there's the other side that says sort of it will naturally follow that television roles will become better if we can change the reality. So the politics and economics and the job market and stuff like that. Do you have a, a feeling that you you lean more on, more towards one than the other? I know it can be sort of chicken and egg. Yeah, I am I guess I'm so cynical. <laughs> I don't think either. <laughs> Racism and inequality is so systemic that I think that um, it's not it's not going to be so simple. Like I can think of kind of null cases for both of those arguments, right? Because for example, the Cosby show, right? Mm-hmm. That was that show. And that's the know, quintessential one, yeah. The doctor and an attorney and 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 actually Bill Cosby who had who has an EDD, I think um, a doctorate of education who he, he very much, I think, purposely actually even did research on, on wanting to pr- kind of produce a show that showed um, African Americans as, as middle, upper middle class educated folks and, and how that was going to change. And, and the reality was it actually fell right into kind of the Reagan era anti-welfare ideology because, oh, look, you know, look at them. They're doing well. Why do we need welfare? Why do we need it? Mm-hmm. You know, you know, there's no inequality. Look at the Cosby's. If, if you just work hard enough, you know. So, in fact, it had the opposite effect, right, because dominant ideology will just kind of usurp anything and, and kind of uh, turn it on its head if necessary in order to kind of fit its um, 
fit its agenda. And so, um, and so that's, that's the argument for, well, TV and movies are can't, you know, can't just by one example, even by multiple examples can, can actually affect change that easily. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And then we have, you know, we have, we had our first African American president, right? So, so, you know, so things, are things getting better? No, because the next president we have is, you know, (laughs) someone who's so ideologically opposed and swing the pendulum swinging the total opposite direction in so many ways. And even though television, I think, is arguably more diverse than it was, I think, um, even in, you know, the Cosby era, it's still, it's still like, um, if that hasn't changed society necessarily, I think that, I, I like to think that over time, the two are progressing towards more open, at least dialogue about all of this, right, acknowledgement. Um, but I think that, I don't know, it's, we're still in a capitalistic society and power and and dominance is still, I think, still in the in the hands of a few elite, and so maybe I would be Marxist in that way. But um, it's it's not it's not so simple as media and media influencing society and vice versa. So it's true that I mean, some people have said that well, Obama maybe wouldn't have been possible except that we did have black presidents being shown on TV, right? That 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 was kind of something that wasn't impossible for people to dream, and perhaps there does have some influence in that way, right? We do know that for sure media, because I do, I mean, I argue for, for I mean, my, the whole kind of premise of my book is that we need to care about this because media mm-hmm. does affect, I think, in terms of changing an entire society, that's perhaps too optimistic, but I do know that um, just in terms of social psychology, that people's, you know, that young children's self-esteem are very much affected by what they see on TV. And so perhaps the idea that um, future leaders of color, you know, are, are, are made if, if we do have more representations of that on media, especially if people are not seeing any in real life, you know, that, that the only maybe people that they can see is on television, you know, and, and, and film it does have a positive effect. But um, being a sociologist, I'm, I'm cynical because, you know, if you think about even Hollywood, we haven't we haven't improved that much in terms of numbers. We've improved a lot, but um, but even post civil rights, you know, I think that I think I, I put in my book that there, there was there were actually uh, you know civil rights lawsuits that were being you know written against Hollywood. But then that was like in the 70s, right? And that has that was squashed by by lobbyists and by studios having power. And I think that you know we haven't we really haven't seen a lot of improvements in terms of actual um, legal movements against Hollywood's kind of biased uh, casting and biased, you know, behind the scenes, it's even worse in some ways, because um, if it goes, like I, like you you mentioned, the, you know, the directors and such. Um, I know that ACLU has that gender, that sexism lawsuit, so that's, that's, a, that's like a first since the seven, the, 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 the like, 60s and 70s, the early, early 70s. I would love there to be a magic pill in terms of media, but mm-hmm. I think it, it takes an entire society to actually, you know, I think move towards change. So, yeah, well, and as you say in the book, there's, there's various intersecting issues at play, and none of them, yeah, none of them uh, have a magic bullet. Uh, I did find it interesting that early on you, you mentioned in the book, at, I wasn't aware of the study until, you, uh, until I saw it here, but prolonged television exposure predicts a decrease in self-esteem for all girls and for black boys, and an increase in self-esteem for white boys. I found that really interesting, because it, does, it, it demonstrates sort of, I guess, one reason to think about this as an issue, right, is that it's not necessarily going to make or break people's careers watching a certain show and then deciding I do or don't want to be a doctor that kind of stuff but it does uh i guess influence how they see themselves in the world right which can significantly change their their decisions and also the the way that they're treated if you were to respond to people saying uh you know there are more important things in hollywood to think about or or why choose hollywood of all the things a sociologist could study what kind of what kind of response would you give i think that Hollywood is kind of this equalizing factor <laughs> that that everybody that well most people 99% of, of the world is tuning into to mass media and and I think what's really important about Hollywood is that it also exports right it's not just kind of isolated in, in the United States it has it has wide influence beyond just kind of the United States especially in terms of what people see of people of color right 
like there was a study of I think in Taiwan of perceptions of black people and there were all these biases and you know in Taiwan it's pretty much homogenous China, you know it's ethnically Chinese Taiwanese and when asked where they got those images from those ideas they got them from Hollywood, right? Because that's that's the only time that they see. So the, the whole contact theory, when you're not, when you have direct contact with a group, your your kind of perceptions of that group come from media. And even though maybe people understand that on a kind of intellectual level that media isn't real, those images, I think especially because it's entertainment, they actually enter your mind really unfiltered, right? Because you're just mm-hmm. kind of you're relaxed, you're not thinking critically about anything, and these, these images kind of stick with you, especially for young people, right? So you mentioned the study about self-esteem by young people. So I'm, like, when I'm watching with my children um, television, or, or even when I'm not, I, I, I try to teach them media literacy. Like, I tell them, like, okay, who are the protagonists in that show that you love to watch? You know, what's the race? What's the gender? So that they would be aware, right? It's, it's a matter of awareness. It's not like Hollywood images are, are like, um, created to, you know, to kind of as propaganda, but they can have that effect if, if, if only certain groups are being represented as heroes, right? And so, but I think that we can counter that by being more, more literate in our, in our kind of media consumptions. And that's part of the reason why I wrote the book too, so that audiences can be more aware of, well, if images are out there, they're not kind of just locked in from from just creative minds that are completely just free to, to dream up whatever they want. No, there are only certain certain kind of images and certain certain dreams, certain storylines that are being that are being allowed to kind of come through. And so we need to be aware of that as a society. And the, and I have a footnote of Gramsci because <laughs> I wanted to get to get to into the ideology. I mean, you know, he theorized that culture, you know, culture and ideology. Uh, have very much a kind of tool to reinforce um, dominant uh, structures of power. So Hollywood is very much that. And I think that, yeah, I think that a lot of times academics are, um, at least in, in even in the social sciences, kind of see Hollywood, um, they don't take it as seriously. And yet it's the one thing that I, I can, every time I teach a class on Hollywood, like everyone knows what I'm talking about because <laughs> everyone is kind of, we're saturated. We're, you know, especially I guess when I teach in Southern California, we're media saturated, you know, and now with social media, all this stuff, it's, it's just, it's everywhere. And so, and especially like, yeah, with learning about fake news. Now we have like, you know, even we, we kind of only consume media that affirms our, our ideological positions, right? And it's a very kind of dangerous time that we live in, I think, in terms of um, if we're not aware of how, of how media can bias us. So, so yes, yeah, so I think that it's, it's important, I think, as, a, as someone who is interested in kind of public scholarship, I kind of don't don't care really what academics <laughs> about this. Um, I really care about that that my research can have a positive impact on society and and the general public. So. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I give uh, I give a test or sort of a fake test at the beginning of my popular culture course, uh, and I ask people to identify the images on a screen, and uh, none of the G twenty other than the U S president of any era really uh, can be identified. And yet all of the Disney characters, even the the sort of side (laughs) characters that appear for like 10 minutes in a film, they're named almost instantly. And then that usually explains, without me having to say more, why this kind of stuff is important or why we ought to think about this. I'm curious, uh, after real inequality... I know you mentioned you're at a teaching institution. I can totally feel feel how difficult that can be to get as much research and writing done as you want in that kind of situation. But I'm curious, what's uh, what's next? What's the question that you'll be pursuing or the, the research ideas that you'll be pursuing now? Well, in I think of last month, we came out with, uh, so 10 years ago, well, about 2000, 2005, 2006, um, in graduate school, I... Me and a, and a few of my friends uh, who are interested in Asian American issues, we came out with a policy report on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in television. So that was the first of its kind. We did it with a with the kind of national civil rights organization. It was Asian Americans um, Justice Center at the time. Um, and so, ten years later, we actually decided to reboot the study and and actually expand the study because we only looked at network broadcast television back then. 
now, you know, we don't kind of be, we don't view television the same way anymore. There's streaming, there's cable, and there's cable that has been streamed. So people are, are I think, are consuming um, a wider a variation of shows and have access to those shows. So, so we expanded it. So that ju- that report just came out, and um, and we were able to find that even though the numbers were better, the the quality of roles still lagged behind, and especially most of the. I think it was like 30% of the Asian American Pacific founder characters were on 10 shows, right? So, um, so there's kind of a, a kind of concentration, even segregation of. Mm. So if you remove those shows, we would, you know, kind of disappear altogether, or th- most of us would disappear. And so, and 10 and like 10% was like on one show, right? It was mm. Like Mar- Marco Polo, if you got and Marco Polo just got canceled, so <laughs> is there another replacement? We don't know. So. So, so it's very it's very tenuous, right? So we were able to show that that even though the numbers are better, it's kind of a concentration on a few shows, and then we also show that screen time wise, um, most of the Asian American um, Asian and Asian American characters and Pacific Islander characters were tokens because they were barely on screen. And so yeah, so that was um, that that was my current that's been my current project for the last couple of years, and that that report just came out. And my next project, um, in terms of kind of media, I, I really kind of want to venture into a more, again, popularly accessible writing form and maybe a hybrid form of some sort. So I'm thinking about, I'm, I'm dreaming about uh, writing a, a memoir of sorts of my youth, uh, growing up partly in Taiwan, mostly in the United States, and and kind of through the lens of popular culture of how I kind of grew up in the United States. So looking at 80s and 90s television and film and whatever was on syndication at the time and and really kind of breaking down like things like um, single parent family sitcoms and um, because there were a lot of those in the 80s and 90s and and also alien stuff like from like Alf to... (laughs) Uh, you know, to Mark and Mindy, to all these, um, all these shows, that, and I wanted to kind of make an argument about immigration and 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 um, migration and and those shows. I haven't completely um, conceptualized everything, but just and romance and you know, growing up as a young girl of color, watching you know, essentially just kind of white romances mm-hmm. and what that means and. And so, yeah, I thought I was trying to trying to, I think, do a do an interpretation of pop culture, but from um, from a perspective that I think hasn't been really um, really been honored, I think, in in book form. So. Yeah, no, well, that sounds really great, and I maybe I'll have you back on if you come up with that because uh, it, yeah, it sounds like something I'd really like to see, and I'm sure a lot of others would as well. It's funny; it just reminds me of the the quote you have in here that I think it's about three percent of uh, female characters were Asian women, which is as many female aliens as the on TV, I think it was. <laughs> yes, so you, exactly. you have as good a chance of seeing an alien as an Asian woman on TV, which is pretty amazing. That's great. No, it's, it's totally that quote that makes me think about, wow, maybe that's why I'm so drawn to uh, <laughs> sci-fi. <laughs> because, because maybe I identify with the aliens. They're, they're, they're about the same as we are, so yeah. I think, yeah, I think... Yeah, you, I think uh, it would be a great project, and uh, I really do appreciate how you take a qualitative stance and a quantitative stance, and and demonstrate a kind of nuanced argument about Hollywood. That uh, that yeah, a lot of a lot of the time, I find uh, one side is far heavier than the other, and I think you you do a good job of what we were talking about as uh, you know individual stories or narratives, but also big picture statistics and that kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, Nancy, I want to thank you really, uh, really for talking to me today, and I really appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. It was fun.